chapter 19. We start reading from verse 6. Let's pray for a moment. Father, we thank you this morning for the wonderful service we already had, the powerful testimonies. Sweet, sweet fervency, Lord, and everything that was done for you today. Our hearts are stirred up that so many came out to witness with you. And we just thank you for every opportunity we have as your church to bring Jesus to others. Thank you for those who gave in the offering. Thank you for the singing. Today, inspire us with a message. Lord, from you today, we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, verse 6. <clears throat> John says, Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, and like the sound of many waters, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord, our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad for the marriage. Give glory to Him for the marriage of the Lamb. Who is the Lamb? Jesus. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. She has prepared herself. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen. That was her job. Bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of service of the saints, of the believers. And he said to me, write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are true words of God. Then I fell at his feet, worshipped him, and to worship him, but he said, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours, the angel said, and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. In usual weddings, the eyes are upon the bride. In this wedding, the eyes should be on the groom. Don't worship me, I'm going to get into trouble, the angel said. If God finds out you're worshiping me, I'll get in trouble. Because that's not for me. Worship is only for Jesus. Say amen. 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 And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it, Jesus, called Faithful and True. His eyes, verse 12, were a flame of fire, and his head are many crowns. And he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in white linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. The second coming of Jesus. Father, we thank you again. Bless the service and bless the word in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to speak this morning on this topic. It's so, so beautiful. It's called, it's called the wedding feast of heaven that's coming. Commonly called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever you have a wedding on earth, there's a lot of excitement. Correct? Huh? Lots of excitement. You know, people, even if you don't know the couple very well, you're excited about it. What will the bride wear? Common questions. I wonder if the groom is going to be nervous. I wonder whether the pastor will speak. No, you don't normally say that. <laughs> you assume you come up with a message. Okay, uh, there's a lot of excitement, family members, there's so much excitement. When you think of a wedding, there's so much joy. They say marriage is, uh, if somebody's happily married, they say, oh, marriage was made in heaven. But really, there is no marriages made in heaven. There is, heaven wills it. But we live our marriages on the earth. And because we live on the earth and we're imperfect people, there may not be a perfect marriage. But there is one marriage that's coming that's going to be 100% incredible. And you and I are going to be at that marriage. 
It's going to be the marriage where God's people spiritually, not physically, but spiritually, are married or joined to their Savior and Lord. His name is Jesus Christ. And what an awesome marriage that's going to be. It's a marriage in heaven. It's going to be amazing. It's an incredible marriage. And you think about that. Think about it one day, very soon, one of the grandest weddings that's ever going to take place in the whole universe. And guess what? You and I, you and I that are seated here today, are going to be part of that wedding. In fact, we're going to be part of the bride. And every saved person, every born-again Christian, everyone who's born again can enter the kingdom of God, Jesus said. Only born again, only saved people, that means washed in the blood, accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, can be at that wedding. If you're not born again today, I want to encourage you to be. But think about that. The wedding supper of the Lamb. It's going to be amazing. Now, we had many weddings this year. Pastor Suhas and Anna got married. Don't talk to him because he's missing out a lot. <laughs> and every time I mention a name, he says he'll miss the whole message. Now he's been thinking about it. You know, the nation Mina got married. Wasn't that great? Uh, got married and started a church the same year. That's kind of interesting. Wow, wow, amazing. How about this? Pastor Doug is getting married. <laughs> Look at him. He's just sat up right now. He's very excited. I was walking with him yesterday, and he's got a marriage book. He's reading about marriage. <laughs> you know, he's got new t-shirts every day. He's, he's, he's taking care of himself a lot. I wonder why. I mean, Pastor Doug is getting married in Bethany. June 29th. That's a big day, huh? June 29th. That's going to be a marriage. Who else is getting married? Come on. <laughs> Uh, at Ryan is getting married. <laughs> Ryan is getting married. Okay. All right. Hey, how about you know? Craig is going to get married. Yeah. Craig is going to get married. Ozzy, Ozzy is going to get married. Uh, what? What about Ankush? Ankush is going to get married. Ankush is going to get married. Now listen. I didn't say when they're going to get married. I said when they're going to get married somewhere, right? Okay, now think about this. So we have this incredible, amazing thing that's happening. And I want to show you that when God instituted marriage on the earth, husband and wife, he actually started the institution of marriage to symbolize a greater marriage that's going to happen in heaven. A spiritual union between us, his people, his chosen people, and Jesus, our bridegroom. It's the other way around. Our union on the earth is a symbol of our union with him. God says in Isaiah, as a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so I rejoice over my people. Can you imagine that amazing intimacy? God is saying, just like a bridegroom loves his bride, oh, I love, I love my people. I love you. I want to be intimate with you. That's the kind of relationship we have. And you know what, God, I want to show you something very unique about this message. There is a Jewish marriage customs. And we'll look at them for a few moments. Yeah. And then we look at the weddings marriage supper that's coming in the future. And I'll show you some fantastic parables today. Okay? Number one, let's turn to Matthew chapter 22. Every wedding has an invitation. Amen? Did you get an invitation? Okay. How do you like it? Now hold it up. The marriage supper will laugh. This is your invitation. And I want to tell you about your invitation. And let's read Matthew 22. There's an invitation being given. And guess what? Everybody in the world is invited to the wedding feast in heaven. Okay, let's read about it. Matthew 22. In Matthew 22, Jesus said, he told this parable to his disciples, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king, that's God the Father, who gave a wedding feast for his son, Hey, did you hear that? Heaven's going to be a wedding feast. 
What do you think about when you think of heaven? You think about joy. I think about laughter in heaven. I think we're going to have so much fun in heaven. There's going to be food in heaven. There's going to be feasting in heaven. There's going to be God's love in heaven. There's going to be joy in heaven. Heaven is, the wedding feast is going to be a lot of fun. I wonder why so many churches today on the earth treat, it look, look, makes it look like church should be a funeral service. How can people be drawn to Jesus Christ if ritualistic churches treat it and make it look like there's a funeral service going on? But heaven's a wedding feast. And it's a wedding feast that God is going to throw for His Son, Jesus Christ, our bridegroom. And listen to the next part. And He sent out His servants to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast. Wow, that's us. Now, what do you think about it? God, the Father in the Jewish custom, would always send out invitations to the wedding feast, and He would send His servants out. That's us. God says, go, go into all the world, Jesus said, and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, making disciples of all nations. Go and preach the gospel, Mark 16, 15, to all creatures. He that believes will be saved. Go make disciples of all nations, teaching them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go, he said, go. And so we go. We go. We go in the praise march. The praise march is going, going out as servants and preaching the gospel and proclaiming the gospel in our city. We go. Peter Akbar and the team goes to reach Muslims every week, and we have the Muslim ministry and the Ruhala tracks. That's going. We're going as servants. Why? Because the invitation is given to everybody. The whole world can come, and we say, hey, come on. The kingdom of heaven is like a wedding feast. In the prisons we preach, we say the kingdom of heaven, Ganesh says, the kingdom of heaven is like a wedding feast. In the slums, Pastor Doug and the team goes, and we say the kingdom of heaven is a banquet. Come on, everybody. Our missionaries go on the fields, and the kingdom of heaven is like a banquet. We were out soul winning on Friday nights, and I want to encourage you. Friday nights we were soul winning, and I met a man sitting at Cafe Day, and we were talking, and guess what? He was a posse man. His name was Neville. And we found out that Neville had been in Baltimore for 40 years. He was a car salesman. And we had a great time talking. And we had 15 people out or 16 people out winning souls, or maybe 10 or 12, but just winning souls on Cafe Day. And somebody was doing that at Kuru, and we were sharing the gospel. And while we were there, Pastor Doug told me a story. Listen to this. It's this an amazing story. Uh, a man got our gospel tract, our Bible tract. Uh, outside somewhere near Mongolia somewhere. Somebody had taken our gospel literature and thrown it on the floor. A Muslim man called Navros picked it up and he read it and he remembered that when he was a little boy in Delhi there was an Indian lady, a Christian lady who used to take kids into Sunday school and tell them about Jesus. He said, I love Jesus so much and I really believe that Jesus is, the Bible is true. And so Navros, you know what he did? He said, I'm going. I'm going to that church. I'm going to find out about them. So he went to the Hindi church. He's been coming out for a year, one year and a half, and, and he wants to be baptized. Oh. Why? Because we went. Because we went. And people are coming to the Lord from all backgrounds. Why? Because we go, we go, we go. The kingdom of heaven is like a wedding feast. Amen. And some people don't accept it, but that's that's the invitation that's given to everybody. Let's read the next verse. And I want you to think about it. And they, some of them, were not willing to come. Then in verse 4, listen to the next verse. Again, he sent out other servants saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fat livestock, and all everything is ready. Please come to the wedding feast. This means that God doesn't give people one opportunity. He sends another. There was a woman in Delhi who met Navroz and gave him the message of Jesus, but he had not accepted it yet. He was too small to do it. But then, some time later, he gets the track, falling on the ground, and picks it up. Why? Because God sends other servants. Amen? Amen. You understand that? People say, what about those who've never heard? God says, anybody who's searching for me will hear me. They will find me. Jeremiah 29, verse 30. Anybody will find me who's searching for me. And so we have this, this statement. But they paid no attention. 
and they went their way. One person went to his farm. Jesus is only telling a story of how people respond to the message of the kingdom of God. And, and uh, one went to his farm, another went to his business. Some of them seized the servants and mistreated them and threw them in prison, killed them. Then in verse 8, then he said to his other servants, the wedding is ready now, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main highways, go to the Gentiles, and as many as you find there, invite them to the wedding feast. Then the servants went out in the streets. Ah, I like that. The servants went where? Into the streets. They went in the streets, and they to gather together all they found, both good and evil. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. People come to church. We don't know if they're saved. You're saved only when you accept Christ. But you come in, you come in, you come in. You bring them in. Now, what do you think about this? There's a little note I want to give, put, put here for all you. If there was a very wealthy person getting married, and they would invite the whole village to come and towns to come, you know what they would do? The host of the wedding would provide for them wedding gowns, wedding garments, wedding clothes. The clothes weren't very amazing. They were just simple, white, beautiful clothes that were given to them. Why? Because when the celebration took place or the reception took place, they didn't want anybody standing there very poor, looking shabby. So they provided them with wedding clothes. Wow. And listen to the parable here. Are you following this? Now think about this parable here. Jesus is saying, but when the king came in to look over his wedding guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. Of course, the Jews would understand what he was saying. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. And the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into hell, the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. In other words, many means, Matthew 22, Jesus died for the many, means he died for the whole world, 1 John 2, 2. Many is equal to all. All are called, all are invited, all are invited to the wedding feast, but some respond and therefore are chosen. And what God is saying here, understand that. And think about that. We are invited to a wedding feast. And you know what I like about it? It's just on this invitation there is a RSVP. Respond if you please. Respond. Respond they sell if you play, right? Here's my French. Okay? Here, here it is. Respond. You are, you are required to respond to the invitation. You've been given an invitation. I say RSVP BYD. You say, what is BYD? You can respond before you die. <laughs> You've got all the opportunities in the world, but once you die, it's too late to respond to the invitation of Jesus Christ. So what happened? We give an invitation. I want to read for you a little poem. And the poem is very beautiful. Think about it. If he should come today and find my hands so full of future plans, however fair, in which my Savior has no share, what would he say? If he should come today and find my love so cold, my faith so very weak and dim, I had not even looked for him. What would he say? If he should come today and find that I had not told one soul about my heavenly friend, whose blessings all my way attend, what would <laughs> Jesus say? We were all shabby. We were all sinners. We couldn't go to the wedding feast. We couldn't stand before a holy God and say, Lord, I'm acceptable in heaven. The Bible says, all my good deeds, all my life is like a filthy rag before God. I'm a pauper. I'm a, I'm a prisoner. I'm a criminal before God. Every one of us is a sinner, so the Bible says. And that's why Jesus came. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, Paul says, He who knew no sin, Jesus, took our dirty clothes. He took our sins on the cross. 
so that we could be given his righteousness. God took my sins on the cross and he gave me his holiness, his righteousness. That's what, that's what makes me now have a wedding clothes on, in a sense. You understand? God took my negative sins on the cross and he gave me his holiness when I believed in Christ. When you say, Jesus, forgive me my sins, I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. Wash me in your blood. Then Jesus washes your sins. He takes away your sins. And he gives you his righteousness. And he gives you his acceptance to come to heaven. Because you're washed clean. And that's like a wedding garment that you can enter heaven. Because you are holy now through the blood of Jesus to enter heaven. That's what the wedding garment meant. In Isaiah chapter 61 verse 10, God said, As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so the Lord will rejoice over you. He has clothed me with garments of salvation, and he has given me a robe of righteousness. Thank you, Lord. Do you understand that? Are you following what I'm saying? I can't stand before God unless I have a wedding garment. I have a robe of righteousness. But praise God, because of Christ, I stand complete in him. I'm washed in the blood. I'm accepted in Christ. I'm given a righteous robe to wear. And now every one of us can enter into the banqueting hall. And the king can look at us and say, you're righteous in him. You're righteous in Christ. What an awesome thing. Who is the host of this wedding? God the Father is throwing the wedding. Who is the bridegroom for the wedding? Jesus is the bridegroom. The wedding is for the Son. Jesus said, the bridegroom will soon be taken away from the earth. Luke chapter 5. And then you will fast and moan. Luke chapter 5. Uh, uh, who is the bride of the wedding? The church. Let me read that for you quickly. We'll just read it. Oh, just code it a little bit. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 to 32. Listen, listen to what it says in Ephesians chapter 5. It says, it's, 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 uh, it's showing you the parallel between earthly weddings and Christ. It says, wives, be submitted to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the church, the body. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her by the washing of the water of the word, that he might present to himself the church, a glorious church, without spot or wrinkle. And then he says this at the end, this I say to you, I'm not speaking only of marriage, Paul is saying, but I speak to you of mystery, and that mystery is of Christ and the church. Who is the bride at the wedding? Us. Us, believers. You see, think about it. Listen carefully. In the Garden of Eden, God, God took Adam, put him to sleep, and from his side performed a surgery, took out a bone. And out of that bone that came from Adam's side, he fashioned Eve, and he presented Eve, the woman, to the man. Out of Jesus' pierced side and his pierced hands on the cross, out of them came his church, born on the day of Pentecost, born by the Holy Spirit. Out of his crucifixion comes the church, and the church from Pentecost to the rapture, when we're raptured and going to be caught up in the sky with the Lord. That whole church is going to be one day going to be presented back to Jesus as his bride. Today, we are his body. Say that with me. We are his body. But one day, we are going to be his what? His bride, the bride of Christ. And that's an amazing thing. What an awesome thing. Uh, the church, think about it. Every single day, they, they say there are 700 million born-again Christians somewhere on the earth today. 700 million. They say that every single day, 70,000 people come to Christ somewhere on the earth. Every single day. Isn't that exciting? Every single day, uh, there are 3,500 new churches formed on the earth. Every day, 3,500 house churches, other churches being formed somewhere on the earth. Yeah, you can give God a hand. There are over 5 million believers, believing, born again churches, somewhere on different parts of the continents, all over preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And think about the billions and millions of people that have lived on the earth, died, and I've got to be raised up in the graves. And when Jesus one day comes for his bride, all those millions of people will be caught up in the sky to meet Jesus in the air. And they will be presented as the bride of Christ. 
Wow, that's amazing. Now what happens? Who are the guests of the wedding? The Old Testament saints. The angels are the guests of the wedding. Hebrews 12, 22. We are the guests. They're going to be raised up. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so this is what's going to happen. At the rapture of the church, we're going to be taken up. The church is going to be taken up when Jesus comes back for us. At the rapture, we're going to be caught up in the sky. Then at the Bema seat, every Christian is going to be evaluated and rewarded for what they did in their bodies while they were on the earth. And positions are going to be assigned for them for the thousand-year kingdom of Jesus on the earth, the marriage supper of the Lamb. You understand that? Positions, the marriage supper of the Lamb is the celebration stage when we the wedding takes place in heaven, but the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place on earth. It will be the thousand-year rule of Jesus on the earth. That's what happens after the second coming. Okay, are you following this? I think with me. A Christian woman went to a, a, a servant of God and she said, guess what? I am assured of my salvation. Praise God. I've got a one-way ticket to heaven. She said, I'm going to heaven and I'm, I'm, I'm not returning back. I'm destined to be with my king in glory. And the servant of God smiled at her and says, that's good, but I think you're going to miss a lot if you've only got a one-way ticket. She said, what do you mean? She said, yeah, I've got something better than that. I've got a return ticket. Because I'm going to go up to heaven to be married to my Lord, and I'm coming back in the second coming to reign with him on the earth. How does that sound? With him in glory. Are you following this? Jesus is going to come back with us. That's going to be quite a match. Now follow this carefully. In the Jewish custom, There were three stages of a wedding. You could just look up here for a moment. That's a wedding. Jewish custom. Okay? Here's what happened. Before the wedding actually took place, there would be somebody who would be the negotiator for the wedding. He was called the friend of the bridegroom. Are you following this? He would go and meet the prospective bride. And the father would send him. They would negotiate what the wedding would be. And on the day appointed, the young man who was getting married would go with his father to the young woman's house that he proposed to be his bride. And her father and his father would sit down together and a marriage contract or covenant would be drawn up. And after the covenant was drawn up, part of that covenant that was drawn up, there was, there was something called a bride price a bride price. Now what is the bride price? The bride price would be like a dowry, but except a little different. The Jewish people did it differently. The guy would give the bride price to the girl. Hello? That's a little different. Now why would they give this bride price to the girl? There was a reason. One was to say, the young man would be saying to the girl, I want to thank your parents for taking all this trouble to raise you up. And I realize that you're coming now to be with me forever. Number two, my bride price is telling you how much I love you. And number three, that money would be kept in case he died and she was widowed. The family would look after her. The family could not use the bride price money. They could live off the interest of it but they could not use the bride price money. Now watch what happened next. After the bride price was settled, the young man would be given a cup of fruit of the wine, not wine, but fruit of the wine, grape juice, and would be given to the young man, and the young man would then take it to the bride and watch what would happen. <coughs> He would offer this cup to her, and he would say these words to her, this cup I offer you. And what it meant when he said that was he was saying, I offer you my life. Would you accept it? Will you marry me? 
the cup was a sign of the covenant. If she took the cup, she had to hit a moment of decision. If she refused the cup and said no, then he would have to go away. But if she took the cup and she drank from the cup, she would have to say, it would be her saying, I accept your life. I give you my own back. That was the betrothal period. It was engagement. And engagement was binding. It was almost like a marriage. The bride and bridegroom would decide a time. And then the bridegroom would leave before he took his leave from the bride. He would say these words to her. Listen to these words. He would say, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I will come again soon when the place is ready. And what he would do is he would then leave us some gifts and he would go away. What he would do in his time is he would literally have to prepare a home for her. A Jewish home was not prepared in some other land. It was usually you had a father's house and land and they would put an apartment to the side. And they would build what was called first a basic house for the honeymoon to get the house ready. They would have the rest of the house later built. But it was built as best as possible, as quick as possible, as best as possible. That house was a honeymoon house. It was called in the Hebrew a chapa or a canopy. And the Jewish weddings are held under a canopy. It was a home. It was a beautiful room, a honeymoon room. But the bride or the bridegroom could not shirk his work. He had to do the house up well. And until the house was fully ready, the father would not let him go and get his bride. He couldn't do that. So if you ask the young man, when are you going to collect your bride? He would have to say, only the father knows. <laughs> now what would the bride do in the meantime? She was waiting and waiting and waiting. She would have many things to do. Number one, from that day onwards, the bride would wear a veil. And that veil would say that she was taken. When she went outdoors, it would say, I'm his, I'm taken, I've been bought with the price. She would also have to prepare a bridal gown. She would stitch it and put filigree work and silver and gold and all the possible things she could borrow from her neighbors and friends and family. And she would stitch this beautiful gown. Well, one day, the father felt everything was ready, and he would tell his son, now you can go bring your bride home. And so the bride and the, the groom would go with his friends, and he would often go at times when she wasn't expecting. In fact, the bride actually did this. Every night when she came home, she would keep the veil when she knew the time was getting close over the house to be ready. She would keep the, the veil right by her side. She would keep a bridal dress out. She would keep a lamp lit. Because she knew that once the shofar, once the trumpet comes, sounds that it's coming, the bridegroom is around the corner. Jesus was going to pick on all of these. In fact, the Jewish customs were just a picture of exactly what's going to happen for the wedding feast. No different. So the bridegroom would come. And when he came, she would have to be ready. And he would take her to his home, the father's house. And there, there would be a wedding ceremony, a private ceremony first for seven days. And they would go into the canopy home, and, and while well, there was a seven-day honeymoon, if you would, the people would be outside. They would know that they got married, and they would know the supper is soon around the corner. The bridegroom's friend would be there to make sure the marriage, to, to witness the fact, yes, the marriage has taken place. And then after seven days, the bride and bridegroom would come out, and there would be great congratulations and a great celebration. And then they would go for the supper, for the wedding feast that would go on as long as the Father decided. Now, what do you think about that? It's amazing. Think of the parallels. Jesus decides that there's going to be a wedding. And John the Baptist is the negotiator, in a sense. He comes on the earth, and he says in John 3, 27 to 30, this is what John says. 
He said, I am not the Christ. A man can receive nothing unless it's given to him from heaven. I am not the Christ. But he who has the bride is the bridegroom. He said, I must decrease and he must increase. He said, the, the, I hear the bridegroom's voice and I rejoice that I heard my bridegroom's voice. I must decrease. John had the first disciples that were going to be part of the church. So he was only introducing the bridegroom. And then after the negotiations was over, Jesus came on the scene. And Jesus was ministering to his disciples. And one day in the upper room, listen to this. Oh, I love this so much. One day in the upper room, Jesus is sitting with his disciples. It is the Passover time. It is time for him to go back to heaven soon. And this is what he does. There are three cups, four cups that they would drink at the Passover meal of grape juice. The third cup was called the cup of redemption or the cup of salvation. And usually it would start with a prayer, O oh Lord God, creator of heaven and earth, thank you for the fruit of the vine that you made for us, and so on. What Jesus said gave thanks, but after that he introduced something very unique. As he gave this cup to his disciples in the upper room, he said, this is the cup of my blood, the fruit of the vine. I will not eat it again for the kingdom. Would you drink from it? And at that point of time, that symbolism, he changed the whole metaphor around. Jesus was saying to his people, I'm making a covenant with you. I'm making a covenant with you. Will I love you, disciples? Will you be spiritually married to me? And Jesus would go to heaven. But before he went, he would say these words. Listen to these words again. We know them well, but I'm going to have you read again from them. Turn to John chapter 14. Just read them with me. Read them with me. John chapter 14. In verse 1 and 2, Jesus said to his disciples, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again soon and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. I'm going to my Father's house. I'm going to my Father's chapa that I made for you. And I will go. I will prepare that. And I will come back again. And this is our time right now. Before he went, he gave us the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1.30, until the day of redemption. It is the Holy Spirit is given as a pledge for us, an arabon. The word means an, an engagement ring, an engagement seal upon us. We are engaged to Jesus Christ. Say hallelujah. We're engaged to Jesus Christ. You have been engaged to Christ your bridegroom and you, when you accepted the cup and the drink, when you said yes to Jesus, when you accepted that, you have said to Jesus, yes, I, you've given me your life and I have given you mine. That's what I'm saying to you. I am yours from now on. And now in the wedding time, in the waiting time, we have to be waiting. And it's required for the bride and the church and every Christian to remain faithful and pure. That's what was required for her. You listen carefully, friends. And the bridegroom, bride would wait and wait and wait for the bridegroom that she had pledged to. I heard about a story of a young woman who got engaged to a man. He was in the army in Poland. And she lived in a little town. And they got engaged. And she was... Uh, he was so excited about her, but he came back a year later on a surprise visit and wanted to surprise her, and, and he couldn't find her at home. And then somebody told him that she was at the village fair, and she was there at the village fair, and she was a little drunk, and she was in the arms of another man. A true story. And oh, he was so disappointed. He was so disappointed. And he went back, he slipped, slipped, went away, and never came back. Jesus won't do that to us because he's, he's going to be faithful to us. But he doesn't want us to be in the arms of the world. He doesn't want us to be. He says, you're in mine. 
and I'm yours, and I don't want you flirting with the world. I don't want you out there in, in the drinking and the parties and, and living like the world. I don't want you to do that. I want you to be following after me with all of your heart. And put a veil on when you go out spiritually and say, God, I'm yours. I'm take him. That's what he says. And have a lamp by your side. And the lamp says, I, the word is a lamp unto my feet. Because so often we get so sidetracked in the details of life. And so we forget we're married or we're waiting for the coming of Jesus. And have your bridal dress being prepared. You know what a bridal dress is? I love it. You say, that's kind of interesting, but, but how do a man prepare a bridal dress? But it is. This is basically what it is. A bridal gown. And the bridal gown is the righteous acts of the saints. It doesn't say it's the righteousness of Christ that's given to us. It means every time you love somebody with Jesus' love, a cup of cold water given. Every time you go through a trial, you are stitching <laughs> your bridal dress. Silver, gold, precious stones, filigree. Your dress is being woven. Uh, be faithful to the end. I will give you white garments in Revelations 3, 5. I'll give you degrees of glory upon you. And every one of us is now preparing degrees of glory. And think about this. Here is the bridegroom, and here is the bride, and here is the people. And that's a mystical way to represent the bride of Christ, because it's really the people. It's not a real bride. But we are the bride of Christ. Physically. And this is us, and think about every one of us, and every one of us will, will be in heaven one day, but some of us will have degrees of glory. Think of a necklace here, it's close to the head. Think of the silver and the gold chains, it's close to the head. And at the beam of seat, Jesus will give us special positions in, in, the, in the kingdom one day. And that's what it's talking about. The whole bride will be there, the sun will reign with Christ. What a beautiful thing that is. Think about that. And Jesus one day will come, and he will come back in, in the rapture, and he will take the whole church with him, and then we'll stand before the beam of seat. While seven years of tribulation will happen on the earth, we will be at the wedding ceremony with Jesus. And then after the seven years is over of terrible tribulation with the Antichrist on the earth, we will come back with Jesus, second coming, and we will reign with him. And guess what? During that beautiful time, Everybody, that will be the thousand-year kingdom of Christ, the millennium reign of Christ. Christ will rule for a thousand years on the earth. Some people have a honeymoon and it's last for two weeks, one week. Jesus will have a thousand-year honeymoon with us. And he will be the bridegroom, and we will be the bride, and the guests will be the Old Testament saints and the Gentiles that are saved before, and so on. And they will be ruling with Christ over, and what an awesome time it's got to be. Oh, I wait for that time. I close with just two reflections today. If you are here this morning, you don't know where you'll go if you die one day. RSVP, please. There's an invitation given for you. The kingdom of God is a wedding feast. And Jesus came. He said, my contract has not been made with silver and gold. The contract that I'm making, the bride price I'm paying, is my own life. Because I want you to be in heaven one day. And only if you're saved, only if you accept Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you accept what he did for you on the cross, can you be in heaven one day. So please accept him. That's a beautiful thing. And if you're a Christian this, this morning, I want to give you another invitation, another one. This is what the invitation is. Love Him. Be engaged with Him. Be occupied with Him. You know what happens? Ask, go spend some time with Pastor Doug, and within two, one hour, he has got to talk about Bethany a little bit. <laughs> you know, that's a good sign to me. That's a great sign when you need to talk about your bride, the bridegroom and the bride. Because that's what couples in love do. We talk about each other. If you're not talking about Jesus to somebody, you're not telling them there's a wedding feast, you're not telling them you're taken, you're not telling them that the bride price has been paid and you belong to Him, I doubt if you're, 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 you're living for Him. I, I would dare say to you, you might be living in the world, you're living in the arms of somebody, and it's not Jesus Christ. I'm going to say to young people in this room, don't you ever think about following an unsafe person. 
You may be a young person, a teenager. Don't even think about it. Because the Bible says if you do that person handsome or ugly or whatever he is will take your heart away from God and you're married to him. And Jesus has come to you. And Jesus one day saved you. And Jesus gave you the cup. And you said to Jesus, you said, Jesus, I accept you. I'm taken. You're taken. You're his. You can't be given to somebody else. You've got the best bridegroom in the whole world. Why not wait for a spiritual godly man to come along? A godly woman to come along. You're going to be married anywhere. Why not wait to get to know Christ? That's all I want to say. He said, I love you. I offer you my life. You said, Everything about you is not the old. We need to live in such a close proximity to the coming of the Savior. We live with the reality of the fact that this is soon going to happen. Very soon, one you could be one heartbeat away from meeting Jesus, one trumpet sound away. The trumpet will blow and you will be gone. One heartbeat, you'll die and you'll be taken away. Don't live a heart by Get it off. Get it off. Say, God, yours. Oh, I can hear it soon coming. I can hear the trumpet sound. It's coming. It's just around the corner. Just a few moments, a few few years, and so we'll be gone. And I'll be in with Jesus, and you'll be with Jesus. We'll be in the wedding supper. And then the marriage supper of the Lamb. I can even hear the silver wedding set up in heaven. The angel is setting up a table. He's inviting you to come. Just come. Come to him. Father, we 